As a service design professional, you want to drive towards positive change. But even though everybody might be in the same car as you, the one wants to step on the brake, the other one wants to go left, while well, you know that you should accelerate and go straight ahead. So what does it take to get everyone in the car aligned and trust you with the keys? That's exactly what we're going to learn in this episode. Here's our guest. Let the show begin. Hi, my name is Brad and this is episode 192 of the Service Design Show. Hello, brave change agent. Welcome back to the Service Design Show the place where we explore what's beneath the surface of service design, what are the invisible things that make the difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and of course, our planet. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine. Today, we're joined by Brad Alfonso. Brad is an experienced service design leader at one of the largest healthcare partners in Australia. And we're going to talk about a topic that we all can relate to. One of the common critiques service design gets is that very few insights eventually get turned into solutions that see the light of day. The service design is primarily focused on ideas and insights but in the end, not solving important business challenges. And to be honest, it's not for the lack of trying, because I know many service design professionals are actively advocating for this. So what's happening is that a lot of our ideas get stuck and die in the handover moments between teams, departments, and people. Different goals and priorities determine what gets done. And we as service designers don't have the ownership, mandate, or responsibility to influence those priorities. So here's a radical idea. What if there were no handovers? What if it was service design all the way through to the very end? According to Brad, service design is perfectly positioned to be the connector across the entire organization. We have a unique set of skills that allows us to connect the dots in ways others can't. Now, this sounds great, but stepping into this connector role isn't something that's going to be handed to us on a silver platter. Others really have to trust us to take the keys and lead the way. Well, somehow Brad managed to get the keys, and today he's going to share with us how he did it. And if having the keys really allows service design to live up to its full potential. So let's gather around the campfire to learn from Brad what the secret is to getting people in the car aligned with us. How we need to be smart with numbers because what gets measured gets done. And how we can get over imposter syndrome and do things that are vital for success, but don't feel like design. I hope you've got your marshmallows ready because I can already hear the fire crackling, which means it's time to get comfortable and give our full attention to the wisdom Brad has to share with us. Welcome to the show, Brad. Mark, thanks for having me. Really great to join you today. Yeah, um, I know you as a, one of the circle members uh, and uh, you've been a very, uh, uh, engaged member, which is uh, absolutely great. And it's nice to have you here on the show because you're not just a circle member, you're also doing very interesting stuff around service design in your organization, which we'll hopefully talk about today. Uh, for the people who don't know who you are, Brett, could you give a short intro in what your role is today and what your responsibilities are? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, Mark, member of the service design show circle and that's been really great uh being part of that program and that community currently my role is uh the senior service design manager at Bupa australia uh, in the health insurance business we're doing some really great stuff uh centered around customer at the moment it's a pretty interesting time in our space uh moving into healthcare or health caring as we're calling it internally uh we're really excited with all the change and shifts that we have in front of us uh quite a customer-centric organization. We are driving with the customer in front. 
Uh, and our service design team is really in the center of all of that change. So it's quite an exciting transformation that we have in front of us. Let's not uh, spoil too much at this moment, but uh, the next question that I uh, want to ask you is, do you recall the moment you learned about service design? Do I recall the moment I learned about service design? Okay. I learned about service design, the phrase about service design in about 2015. Uh, that was the time where I came across uh, corporate innovation and the application of design thinking through the practice and craft of service design, and that was 2015. And since that, uh, I've gone on a bit of an odyssey, uh, immersing myself into the space in service design in a corporate setting, and, and really, uh, really excited. It has definitely taken my, my, my life and my journey on a, you know, a path I did not think I would go. Now that you mentioned this, uh, we actually have an article that uh, talks a little bit more about your background. So I'll make sure to add it in the show notes where you share actually how you got into service design and uh, share a bit more about your journey. So that's, I think, a very good interest and an interesting piece to share. Brad, we also have a, a rapid fire lightning question around five questions to get to know you as a person next to the professional. I see you smiling. Uh, so you know what's coming, uh, but you don't know the questions because I <laughs> shuffle them around this time. Are you right. ready? Let's do it. Please finish this sentence. The most important quality in a friend is... Patience. The best part of my day is when... That's a tough one, Mark. You're cutting deep here. When I wake up, that's a good time. <laughs> you wake up, I'm here, got my family pretty grateful for the life I live and that's a good mm. place to be. All right. Next one. My greatest fear is that that I will live a life without reaching my potential. Next one. Fourth question. I've always wondered why. Oh, there's too many, Mark. You got me trumped. <laughs> <laughs> Just, <laughs> I'm stuck. Just the first thing that too, comes to I'm mind. too curious, Mark. I'm too yeah. curious. All right. I'm too uh, curious. Look, uh, I've always wondered why uh, things always appear harder and more difficult than what they need to be. Right. Noted. Okay. The fifth and <laughs> that, final that one, and then you'll be off the hook. <laughs> Our world needs more. Needs more service designers, Mark. Come on now. We know <laughs> this one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk about that. Brett, uh, congratulations. Uh, these are tough questions. We uh, spiced them <laughs> up uh, uh, a few episodes back. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe we need to uh, tone them down. But then again, uh, we want to we want to get deep and personal here. Cutting, Brett, cutting deep, Mark. Cutting got, deep. Got me there. Yeah, got yeah, me. yeah. That's that's what we do here on the Service Design Show. So let's talk about the thing that you want to address uh, with us today, and that's that. As service designers, we should own the entire journey. Is that correct? Is that uh, how you feel about it? It's, a, it's an interesting call out. I've started to develop this belief that, you know, service design, we look at the, the journey of the customer experience end to end. That's a really great role that we play. And part of that role is we design and, you know, we won't talk about specific methodologies. Um, you know, it's not a, not a good week for design thinking in some forums and circles um, this week, but uh, we use methods to be able to design for a customer and we, you know, become the idea factory. And I'll use, you know, words that have been said over time. You become the ideas factory or you're just in that space around concept, but is it time that we really start to really take that holistic approach to taking ideas and empowering organizations by going right through to implementation, being the, the owners, the champions of taking those ideas right through? I'm starting to believe that there's probably some really strong value in really showing that you know, insight into action and really turning the coin on what service design can deliver and the value we can bring an organization. That's Interesting. So um, I'm happy that we're able to spend some time on this. Can you 
take us back to the moment or take us on this journey, how you started to develop this belief. What got you uh, thinking about this and sort of trying to make it explicit? Yeah, I, I love I love the discovery process. I, I love the art of designing. I love the art of bringing things together to be able to tell a, a really great narrative and a really great story uh, around a possible solution that you're going to solve these really great customer problems. And for me, I believe the the pain for me on this journey is being able to craft these really great stories and these really great solutions and concepts for customers. A lot of thinking, but the pain comes from not being able to take that through to delivery. The pain comes through, and we're talking in a you know in an enterprise environment where you know our listeners are largely from. You're fighting the good fight of services on within enterprise. There's constraints, there's complexity, there's integration. It comes from the pain of being able to push through that and get your solutions to market. Have you, um, and I think you rightfully mentioned that we do feel this pain as a community where we feel that we're not able to push through to implementations where we actually see our recommendations or ideas uh, make a tangible impact on customers, on patients, on and on the business. Have you been in situations where you sort of firsthand experienced this pain? I, th I think it's part of the <laughs> passage uh, for for service designers, right? Yeah, in an enterprise, uh, and definitely the way that service design get set up and I can only speak to an Australian market and understanding the Australian market and its application within our space currently uh, for service design is deeply embedded in large enterprises. There's very much a focus around customer and we have a lot of things to be grateful for that and you've seen service design scale. But with that scaling of service design within large enterprises, they come lots of pain points. Um, it is being able to take an idea through to implementation. We have organizations that are split up by silos. We have organizations that have a distinct handoff. And for most part, roundabout way of answering the question, we do all this really great design work, but we get to a handoff point where there's a friction and the work stalls, gets stuck, gets paused. And uh, that handoff is a, po a pivotal moment. And it seems that uh, there is currently always a handoff at some point to somebody who needs to, who's working on the actual touch points, who's working on the channels, whether that's a digital channel or physical channel or whatever. There's somebody always at some point um, responsible for the implementation and we're not involved in that have you have you found an i don't know is there i don't know if the right word is an alternative but uh should we try to eliminate the handoff so this is this is where i landed on this uh idea of you know service design really taking it right through and you know realistically we can't do everything. We're, we're very much not experts at everything. But what service design does as a as a craft, I believe, you know, we're great facilitators. Uh, we're we're orchestrators of not just the experience, but potentially orchestrators of an idea through to implementation. And what I truly believe here is for service designers to be able to play the role of facilitator in a truly cross-functional func cross functional fashion by ideally leveraging the skill sets with all of the key players and all of the key stakeholders and all the key SMEs that we engage as part of our project. If we are able to actively leverage that cross-functional brilliance, then that will be a vehicle for us to be able to push through in owning idea through the implementation. It's not something we can do on our own. Yeah, I, I think 
most of us will agree that, and I don't think we have the ambition or the naive vision that we can do everything, and maybe in the early days, but I think you know, we are getting a re more realistic uh, idea that this is a team effort, collaborative effort. The challenge uh, that uh, that's here is service design has to be positioned in a certain way in the organization to be able to fulfill this role. And my experience is that that's often not the case. I'm curious, what have you found? Some things need to be true uh, for this to succeed. And ideally, I feel like one thing that's really important is service design sits uh, from a problem-solving space in a unique spot. Uh, we are able to bring together the business need and the customer need. And we have a, a really great understanding of connecting strategy right through with product or implementation. We play that unique role in being that connector, which is absolutely fabulous. So we're uniquely positioned to do this. I feel that being able to leverage the cross-functional teams, bring them together around a problem, and take it right through. Uh, it requires service design to be, yes, you're right, in a certain position, respected in the business, viewed as important. It needs to be viewed as uh, valued and connected to strategy in order for it to execute on this. And those are already pretty challenging conditions to create. <laughs> uh, but let's, for a second, assume that that's the case. So. We are in this good spot. We are well positioned. People do respect us. How do we make most out of our potential out of this situation? You mentioned something about cross-functional collaboration and communication. Could you share a story with us uh, how that played out for you? Uh, there was a particular piece of work that you know I led as a service designer. It was a a service design sprint, a uh, really engaging piece of work. Uh, we had a cross-functional team that we set up around a key customer problem, and it really was a customer problem at that time. So very much led with a customer lens. We unpacked this sprint. We had channel teams and working in a, a service organization. You have uh, you know, our frontline teams, which manage our physical touch points, uh, you know, contact centers and retail teams. Uh, we had messaging teams, uh, digital messaging teams, uh, and we had our uh, digital teams as well. So uh, our digital touch points, our web and, and app teams involved as well. But to that point as well, we also had some of our backend teams involved as well. Some of the, the systems that have information that we need, our uh, customer information, our product information. Uh, so we had this pretty cross-functional team, front end and back end, but also uh, a team of people that really understood the business uh, as well. So we had some key business stakeholders that manage different parts of the business that are invested in this particular customer problem. And so true cross-functional brilliance, we were able to take this team through this initial sprint. And we understand this as power service design. We, we run this cross-functional team. We, we come out with a concept at the end. That part is all consistent and, and all normal. Where the idea into execution or the strategy into execution part came through is once we came out the other end of this piece of work, uh, there was collaboration then with the further digital teams or the people that would be working on the front end. There was work closely by myself with our back end teams to be able to take the data and start to feed that through. And what happened out of that was there was a bit of a transition from my role and my day-to-day -day changed in very much a service designer to playing a bit more of a product management role or a management role of this piece of work. Now, I wasn't doing a whole lot of design work uh, in the truest sense that we think of design, but what I was doing was I was still owning that idea. I was owning that concept and I was owning that uh, piece of work and orchestrating to the, the expertise of those uh, supporting teams. Thank you for sharing this example with us. One thing 
that I'm sure a lot of us are curious about is you quickly stepped over the moment where you said, well, we had this amazing team in the room, uh, multi and cross disciplinary. Can you tell us a bit more about how did you get there? What does this require from the organization, from you? Because like, I get that the implementation part and pulling through is important, but the first step is how do you get those people in the room in the first place and make them want to contribute and collaborate? Uh, and I'll leave it at there. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about like the, the journey up to that moment? One thing that needs to be true is uh, having a customer-centric organization. So for this part and, and with this particular experience, we had a customer-centric organization where there was a focus on customer need. And so that was our right to play in engaging a broad stakeholder network and being, getting people engaged around this particular problem. The next thing that we needed to do was we needed to prove the business benefit. Uh, you know, there has to be a commercial connection. And, you know, as, as service designers, we need to be able to talk both. Yes, we can talk customer, but we really need to speak the commercial side of the problems we're trying to solve. They need to be hand in glove. We need to be solving for both. So with that, once we were able to work through that market size and we had a clear business case behind the type of problem that we wanted to solve, Thirdly, one of the things that was a bit of a, a win in being able to cross this chasm in getting buy-in, not only did we take people on the journey as you do with the service design process, but what uh, I sought to do as part of this engagement is really work hard to understand the perspective of each of those teams that were supporting the work and what was the win-win for them to engage within that work. And what we created was a set of win-win circumstances or situations that we were able to bring together as we drove through this MVP. So it sounds like uh, that you did quite a lot of work, quote unquote, up front before you were able to get people ready to take action and collaborate. Is that correct? A lot of context setting. Uh, let's talk about it in a really practical sense, right? Uh, sure. You have, you have a business problem and as service design and working in customer experience, that's our home, right? We, we're really close to those customer problems. We connect with them really quickly. They're, they're part of our working rhythm. We understand that. Bringing it together, the commercial side required me to connect with certain teams to be able to pull those dumps together. So that's one piece, that's one key task and one job that we need to do. The next part about bringing people on the journey outside the process of service design was really working hand in glove with their product managers, their product owners, really understanding their systems, understanding the problems that they face, also trying to understand the ambitions that they have. And so coming together really practically, what's your roadmap? What are you trying to achieve? What's your vision? What's your product vision? Now, I want to pull three different products into my one solution. How do I make that happen? Yeah. And that contextual awareness about what's important to the business as a whole and every moving piece in the business as an individual, every department, that is that piece of knowledge and insight is the thing that allows you to take the next step. If you step over that and just try to get people in the room, that's... Um, they might that they might join your session, but then you're never going to be able to actually get them to take the next step as well. That's at least my assumption. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we I like to think of service design. We're very uniquely placed, as mentioned before. We have this broad remit. We go from strategy down to implementation. We need to play with a win-win mindset. What we can solve together can suit all of us. It's not a matter of bringing people on the journey to serve one purpose. Do you feel that we should first try to map the organization and uh, the needs and desires of the organization before we start looking into the needs of the customers? 
that's a good one. Uh, where does my brain jump with that one? You know, there's there's ways that an organization can align around problem spaces. And whether you're customer centric, whether you're product centric, whether you're platform centric, and then you know you can align to one of those, or there's there's a handful of others there as well that I haven't mentioned. But you can you can align yourself and put everything in the kitchen sink against that, and maybe that's the way to run things. The other part, second part of that is, especially in service design, to go back to your point around mapping problems. If we were to map problems, how do we bring them back to what each system can do, what each team can do, and what are those dependencies that cross, you know, interlay with that? Uh, you know, that's that's where the tricky uh, and and the fun stuff happens. We are really curious to learn about how did you get those other teams to sort of put you in control or um, I don't know if that's in, in the lead. So they have their own agendas. They have their own KPIs. They have their own ways to measure success. And now you are bringing them together with other uh, departments who have their own KPIs. Like wh what did it take for them to trust you to go on this journey with you? To be trusted, you have to trust. So in getting people around a problem, I, you know, I'm, we work, we'll work on this problem together. We'll, we'll get to that solution together. You know, there's, there's great value in engaging everyone that's going to touch the solution, engage them right at the start. Have them be part of all of that kickoff. Uh, you know, there's a habit of service design where we may only engage certain parts of the business and then we take through into, you know, a technical realm and then try to work through something yet, you know, technical teams or system teams haven't been engaged and so they're a bit disconnected. So first part is to be trusted, you got to trust and get people engaged around your problem at the start. Provide a vision of where you want to go. There are the experts in their space. Let them feed into a way to get there. Yes, uh, trust to be trusted. The way you're describing this to us, it sounds like it might get, it might be pretty big from the start. So involving everybody who could or needs to be involved might require quite a lot of people, quite a lot of logistics, coordination. One of the things that I've heard often people recommend in service design is start small and do the things that you have direct influence on. This does sound a little bit like that's contradicting your approach. How do you feel about that? I don't think there's, there's not one set way to, to solve problems. So I think in, in looking at a problem space and I think it's a matter of picking your battles. Some problems, yes, start off small, operate within your circle of control. Other problems, that might require you to shift your approach, might uh, require you to think differently. And maybe there are some problems that you do stretch out of that circle of control. You do try to play your card at influencing and creating a greater circle of influence. I think it's uh, yeah. taking yeah. a step back and checking out the environment. So when I, yeah, when I was formulating my question, the next thing that came to my mind was, so let, let's, let's assume that there are different challenges that require a different approach. If you reflect on the example that you described, what made this challenge, this scenario suitable to take this more holistic approach compared to uh, something where you would have st had started small? I think there was a few factors that played into my favor in this particular situation. One of those was uh, I was deeply passionate <laughs> about the solution. I think there's you know a danger in that, but in this particular instance, it was something that I was deeply passionate about. Uh, it was a solution that I believed in, and 
I needed to drive it in that sense. Secondly, we were able to set up, and this is something that people can take away. So there's there's passion in if you really love and you're really engaged in this particular problem and you really want to drive it through, that was something that I needed to push through because it wasn't it wasn't all um, you know, everything you I may have hoped for. <laughs> there were many setbacks, as, as you can imagine. So I had to be passionate. The next part was, as service designers, uh, I was able to make a really clear connection with each of those teams and use system thinking to understand how they played a really important role in the bigger picture of what this solution could be. And there's value in that. And so setting that vision with those system and product teams, I was able to align this particular product that we were trying to build, the vision of that, with the vision of their individual systems and products that they were leading that would come together in this final solution. The second part is also very interesting, um, but I briefly want to zoom in on the first part you mentioned about your passion. What was it about uh this uncommon situation because i don't hear well i do hear a lot of service design professionals who are passionate about their work but they lose the passion for maybe the organization or like they get bummed out by the slowness and the bureaucracy what made you passionate about this specific challenge i think there's there's a few factors here and one of those ones that i like to remind myself uh, throughout this journey was I needed to be able to recalibrate my my mind on what success was and what the metrics of success would be for me in delivering this particular project. And so, you know, traditionally, service designers, we look at, or traditionally I at the time, looked at delivering projects. You do some really great design work. You have a killer pack. You have a really good showcase. You engage the business, you get them really excited around this particular problem space. But then being able to own that piece of work, post that part, take it through. Um, I was especially passionate around this particular concept. But once I got to that next point where it became a bit more of a product management role, it was really being able to dig in deep, change my metrics of success, recalibrate what I considered uh, what would be success and set myself on a mission for that. And I believe as service designers, we have enough tools in, in the shed to be able to navigate problem spaces. You know, you're not always using a double diamond, but you're working from mist to clarity. You're you're being able to push through a solution or a problem space. You're being able to pull in the right people at the right time because you understand who plays a role in what. And I just had to keep pushing towards that. And having that as an end goal and giving myself a mission was something that was able to drive me through. And when you say that you had to recalibrate, recalibrate your metrics and what success looks like, could you share a bit about that with us? Uh, There's probably layers to that, to be fair. Uh, the first one being, you know, metrics of what completion is. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is success for the project. I've delivered this project. And now it's done. I'm, I'll move on to the next one. I think there's a metric there within myself internally, what I was going to get satisfaction from, what I was going to be fulfilled by. Uh, the next part, was re resetting myself on what I wanted to learn. What was I going to learn out of this next part? Getting really pointy around the commercial side, really uh, understanding the commercial metrics and writing out business cases, really diving into that product management aspect. And then thirdly, really digging deep into the technical side of uh, my delivery. So really understanding the individual platforms I was working with, working closely with uh, the devs that were writing the code around this particular product, 
those were all going to be stretch goals for me. So my metrics of success changed. That was not what I'd set out when we initially looked at the problem. So I made it my mission to understand every one of those details in the greatest possible way that I could, but also at the same time, play the role of service design in connecting that detail into an overall strategy. Um, and one of the wins out of that was I was able to give these teams who are so in the detail a real clear connection to strategy and how what they were doing would play out and benefit customers. And that was, that was pretty cool. What does this tell us about your position inside the organization and your role inside the organization that you had the freedom to recalibrate your metrics? I'm saying this because often what success looks like isn't defined by ourselves. Uh, we have a superior who tells us what success looks like. And I think this is also one of the barriers to working in a more holistic way and uh, getting to implementation is that we are measured by other means of success. So again, coming back to the question, looking back at this, what does this tell us about your position and role inside your organization? It, I, a lot of this comes back to trust, right? So there's obviously a, a level of trust uh, to be able to take the keys uh, with an idea and, and take it from idea to implementation. There's certainly a level of autonomy uh, that our service design team and service designers are um, charged with, which is you know, really exciting and uh, we're really grateful for that. Uh, and there's also a culture that we operate within where service, service design and customer experience is highly valued. And I think that's something to not take for granted and something to really acknowledge as key factors at a cultural level there. With, for service design to thrive in this way, you need to have that. Yeah, that's, uh, I like the way you express this, uh, handing over the keys or giving the keys or giving the autonomy to service design. That is, uh, that is a big leap. And the fact that your organization values customer experience on, I'm assuming, a very high strategic level, that definitely helps. Like there's less convincing to do, less selling to do, and there's more actual implementation to do. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the details, but how how much time did this take to get your organization to this level? Was this um, a gradual iterative development process or was it a matter of a new CEO stepping in and saying, okay, this is important from now on, or was it option C, something else? How do you see this? Uh, what we've had, we, we've been on the path uh, of transformation uh, around customer for nearing on uh, 36 months now. Uh, we've had some really strong leadership and endorsement uh, around customer. Uh, and that's a really clear um, approach that we have around solving for our customers. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of really good people um, that are that have spent a lot of time setting this up and embedding and implementing. And uh, what we have is a really strong culture around customer. And so service design is uh, viewed as important. It's valued. And so within that, that's like the bigger picture, uh, what we've needed to do, and it goes back to that commentary around trust. Uh, to be trusted, you need to turn up, uh, you need to be credible. And uh, some of the things that we've focused on in service design is delivering really great work within our circle of control. And what we've aimed to do is really talk to the key business needs by bringing that together with the key customer needs. That's been our focus. And when you say we've been able to deliver some really great work, what does great, what are the criteria of great? Yeah, it's a good, good question. So uh, what, we, what we really focus on, and, and currently to date, uh, our focus has been really on the, on the biggest customer problems. 
So our team picks the biggest customer problems from a customer point of view. So we use uh, you know, specific measurements and frameworks around measuring what works for customers and, and what our customers want and need, uh, particular surveys, etc. And so our team works really closely uh, around those metrics, remembering what doesn't get measured doesn't really matter. So <laughs> if we're not measuring it, we need to be... Uh, we need to make sure we do because if it's not measured, it doesn't matter. So that's that's the main thing. Um, the other part is uh, we work really closely around understanding the commercial side around our problem spaces, so that when we are designing solutions, we are able to very clearly articulate what's the business benefit we can attach to a really great customer experience and the return on. What does it take to do this? Because that business benefit that uh, we sort of understand but find hard to implement, do you have any special expertise on your team or was this just there from the get-go? How do you bring that in? As mentioned at the start of the call, none of these things are done in isolation and uh, we certainly don't operate in a vacuum uh, where we understand uh, how to do everything here. Um, but we, we definitely rely and connect on you know, really great people around the business. Uh, we leverage that cross-functional excellence. And as mentioned, when you've got some really great people to bring into your problem space from the get-go, that's what we do. And so we'll bring those right people in from around the business to be able to collaborate on, understand the, the business value of the customer problem. Who would you say... Um has the biggest contribution of the people you bring in in that stage to define that business value? For us personally, in within our team, uh, we, we belong within customer experience. And so it's a customer experience uh, and service design team. And we have some really uh, crack customer experience managers, customer experience lifecycle managers. And they're really charged with owning that customer journey uh, and understanding uh, the value of experience uplift throughout that journey and so working closely with them uh, to solve problems we're able to really work through uh, the ROI of those problem spaces. So these uh, people, these customer experience managers, these journey managers, they have the ownership and responsibility for looking at the metrics from a customer experience point of view but also from the business objective perspective, correct? Great. Right. So I know that we uh, discussed a lot of things related to setting the conditions, creating the environment to make this happen. I think that's it is very important. But maybe uh, you also want to address th some things that happen after that moment. I know you touched upon that, that your role had changed to being a more of a product manager. Is there anything that you like to additionally highlight uh, around that stage of the process? I believe that uh, what we have is it's, it's just an interesting time, right? Um, when you're going through that problem space and you're trying to solve for this particular solution, being able to take that idea through implementation carry that vision through uh, it forces you to let go of a few things that we really love as service designers and it does force us to move into a space that might be a bit more uncomfortable uh, a space that's not familiar um, or a space that's uh, you know really going to test us and doesn't quite follow the process or follow uh, an approach uh, that's set out for us and so being able to shift my mindset around what was in front of me uh, and being able to leverage the expertise of people uh, working closely with me. I, I think that was what set me up for success in being able to take this particular problem right through to solution. Can you be uh, maybe a bit more specific? Like how, what was the change? What was the transformation that you had to go through? Like in myself or the, the project itself? Let's start with yourself. So to that point before, I had to just be open. I had to be open to exploring the change. I had to be open to 
taking charge of this particular problem and driving it through to implementation. Uh, to be open to taking on and wearing different hats that I otherwise wouldn't wear. I had to shed the the title of service designer in some part or what was good service design or what is service design. I had to let go of that. That was me internally. And then within the project itself, the shifts and changes within, within that, it was less of a focus on handover and it was more of a focus on throughput. So I wasn't handing over anything. I was taking it through. That's a, that's a mental shift. And that shift, um, what was the, if you look back on this, what was the most challenging part there? I have some assumptions, but I'm curious if you have some thoughts on that. For you, what was the biggest challenge in that shift? You know, it, uh, I often describe the project uh, as the uh, the myth of Sisyphus. So it's a, <laughs> it's a Camus short story uh, about a man that's destined to push a boulder up a hill and uh, without ever really getting to the top. And... Uh, <laughs> That was that was how I I, I coined uh, this project, and you know it it did feel a little bit like that at times, but it was settling into that discomfort that maybe wasn't exciting uh, in the same way that much of our design craft and the service design process can be, but it was settling into that discomfort that served me well. Yeah, that was one shift. That's interesting. So settling into that discomfort that. It, it is hard work. It is mostly not exciting. It is the grunt work, the grid work to get to the top of the hill, even though you know you might never eventually make it and still push through. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're almost conditioned to see progress as you step through a process, right? You step through the design process, there's, there's you know, some really good milestones, but... um struggling to see that in a, in a vacuum of heavily integrated organization, matrix systems, dependencies, business cases, but then being able to take that through is the exciting part. You mentioned something very, very fundamental here. Um, we often talk about patience and uh, perseverance with regards to service design. I'm very curious, what, what kept you going in this journey when you didn't see immediate progress or you weren't able to measure or quantify immediate progress? I always thought about the fact that I was learning. And that's one part. You know, I was learning something. If it was uncomfortable, if it was a challenge, uh, looking within myself, why was that a challenge? Why was it uncomfortable? That reflection itself is a learning. Then on top of that is all of the you know, technical work, all of the work that you were connecting in with the teams and learning this different space around how to take stuff through to implementation. But owning that part of the implementation, not being the practitioner, not being the, uh, the designer in that space, I was learning and that was, that was something that I was able to lean back on. That was always a learn. I can imagine that that's a metric for you and sort of enjoy the process and uh, enjoy the learning aspect. But if you have to sell that as an outcome to the organization, uh, to your manager, to your sponsors, to your stakeholders, um, it might, you know, it might be a hard story to sell that you're saying, okay, it doesn't look like we made actual a lot of progress, but we learned a lot in the last six months. Like, how did you frame that? Well, I, I mean, as I said before, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't really matter, right? So everything needs to be measured. Uh, if you want to make any kind of change, it needs to be measured. And that's consistent with everything in life. So can it be quantified? Can you qualify that? Uh, and so every part of the project 
uh, we were able to take away some key learnings. We were able to drive a connection to what we were doing on the ground with this particular product into uh, a commercial sense. We are able to speak the metrics. We are able to speak the benefit to business. Uh, we are able to speak the, biz- uh, the benefit to customer if we are able to deliver it as well. So that, that was something we were able to reiterate. Uh, and within that time as well, we, we actually set this particular piece of work off as an example around a test and learn culture and being able to drive that through as a particular uh, initiative that thrived in this environment. Uh, and so we, we really lent into that. Uh, and that was something that we were able to talk to the business back and, and get some clear understanding on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense uh, to also use this as a example of how this culture actually looks in practice. Brad, I uh, we uh, went into a lot of directions and uh, had a pretty holistic uh, conversation about this topic. If you had to summarize our conversation so far and offer us maybe a single piece of practical advice that we can take away and apply in our practice the next day, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? I think the, I believe the the future of service design is taking ideas through to implementation. I believe that it's our role. And we have a responsibility to be able to lean into being able to take things through to implementation. One of the key pieces of advice that I would give service designers looking on moving in this direction, and or if, even if you're not, something that will sit with you well is really focusing on what's measured and what matters and bringing that into your work. That has to be part of your conversation daily. Have that in your stand-ups with your team. Talk to your practitioners around that. There's deep growth in facilitating an environment where service designers get exposure to all of that. We'll definitely make a note of that. And I encourage and second your advice. Brad, uh, thanks so much for being so open and addressing this topic and sharing a bit about uh, not just the journey that your organization is on, but also your journey. Uh, very interesting to hear. I'm sure I'll learn more about it inside the circle, but for uh, this episode, we have to leave it at this. Thanks again for coming on and for sharing with us. Pleasure, Mark. And, and thank you f- so much for the opportunity. Really great uh, to speak with everyone. Thank you. Was there anything that inspired you from the lessons that Brad shared with us? Leave a comment down below. It would be great to hear from you. It's great that you're still with us to the very end of the conversation. If you've enjoyed the episode, you can do me one big favor. Please click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but to let me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. And before we part ways, Please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've invested a part of your day to learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you're going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.